dead in the water if he doesn't build that wall. Dead, dead, dead. I have now tabled a motion of no confidence in this government. I'm proud that she can be the donor, but I'd rather have him a daughter. I want to read it to you the way I believe I said it. And that's this. White nationalist, white supremacist, Western civilization. How did that language become offensive? Why did I sit in classes teaching me about the merits of our history and civilization? That's the end of the quote. Iowa Republican Steve King's words in a recent New York Times interview have reverberated throughout the House. Last night, the minority leader led a unanimous vote to remove King from the Judiciary and Agriculture Committees. And today, the House passed a symbolic resolution condemning white nationalism and white supremacy that cited King's quote. Zimbabwean security forces have killed at least eight people and detained 200 while clamping down on protests across the country, according to Amnesty International. Zimbabweans have been protesting since Monday against a 150% fuel price increase that President Emerson Menangagwa says is necessary to address fuel shortages. A federal judge ruled the Trump administration can't use the 2020 census to ask people whether they're American citizens. U.S. District Judge Jesse Furman sided with plaintiffs that include civil rights groups, 10 cities, and 18 states, arguing the question discriminates against immigrants. But Furman only ruled on two of seven court challenges to the controversial question, and the administration is likely to appeal to the Supreme Court. Twelve days after China's Chang'e 4 lander successfully reached the far side of the moon, the country claimed another win, the first crop grown on its surface. The cotton plant is the first species to sprout in a canister that also includes the seeds of potatoes and the eggs of fruit flies in the hopes of creating a self-sustaining biosphere. Prime Minister Theresa May headed into today, knowing it was all but certain that the Brexit deal she'd been working on for nearly two years would go down in flames. Can you survive another defeat in the House, Prime Minister? Try as she might, May hasn't been able to figure out a solution for what's called the backstop, the part of her deal that could end up treating Northern Ireland as part of the EU, for trade purposes at least, after the rest of Britain leaves. We don't want Brexit! You think my vote don't count? Well, you're mistaken! And I'm willing to die for freedom, not like you, you spite That prospect was unacceptable, not just to May's opposition, but to her own Conservative Party. Thirteen ministers in her government have quit specifically over Brexit. One of them is Sam Geemer, who left his post as Science and Universities Minister in December. If you were a rising star in the government, then you resigned. Why? I resigned because when I looked at Theresa May's uh, Brexit deal, there is no way that I could support it. And um, if you can't support uh, the Prime Minister's uh, business, you cannot carry on being a minister in the government. Was that hard? It was agonising to start with, but in retrospect, it's the best decision I've made since I've been in politics. What is the issue with the deal, in your opinion? We've got this thing called the backstop in the agreement. What that means is that we are splitting the United Kingdom up. And my view is whatever the mandate for the referendum was, it wasn't a mandate to break up the country. The mortal blow will be delivered by the Conservative Party, the party of government, this is almost unprecedented. I, I, I think at times like this, it all comes down to what you're in politics for. Without wishing to be too sanctimonious about it, I thought, this doesn't work for my constituents, it doesn't work for the country, and I'll put my hand up and say so. When you go into the chamber and vote today, are you voting to define slightly what Britain is? Well, in... in Today is about the Prime Minister's deal and rejecting that, which is what I will be doing, because I don't think it's what Britain is. I don't think that we should be supplicants. 
There are differences in this House today, but I believe we can come together as we go forwards. And let me reassure anyone who's in any doubt whatsoever, the Government will work harder at taking Parliament with us. And as we move... The problem I suggest with this agreement is that it doesn't settle anything and it doesn't satisfy the vast majority. In fact, it satisfies no one properly in this House. As the debate wore on, the pleas of those supporting the deal grew ever more desperate. Do we opt for order or do we choose chaos? May's deal failed spectacularly by 230 votes, the largest loss by a sitting government in history. May is now required to come back to Parliament with a Plan B on Monday, but she's got something else to worry about in the meantime. I have now tabled a motion of no confidence in this government. And I'm pleased, I'm pleased that motion will be debated tomorrow. No government in modern times has ever suffered a defeat as big as this. Leadership contests, no confidence votes, politics as usual is the last thing we need in the, at this particular time. My personal view is that there is no majority for any Brexit option and that ultimately where we're going to end up, even though it's not where I wanted us to end up, is that we're going to have to let the people into the process through a new referendum to make the ultimate decision. Democrats in the House of Representatives tried to put Republicans on the defensive over the shutdown by holding a vote on a bill that would reopen the government until February 1st. And the joint resolution is not passed. Republicans wouldn't bite, and the bill failed. That's not surprising, because as much as it might seem like furloughed government workers are being held hostage for President Trump's border wall, President Trump and his allies are being held hostage too by hard-right thought leaders who are threatening a revolt if Trump doesn't make the wall happen. I suspect people think of you and say, here's a kind of bomb-throwing columnist who has been you know, on the same side as Donald Trump on most of these issues. What people don't know is... I actually believe it. Well, you actually believe it. <laughs> but you've been in contact with the president. You had some influence in the president's immigration policy, right? Um, he reads my stuff, as everyone should. I have been advising the president, whether on Twitter columns or in private conversations that you're not allowed to know about, since election day. <laughs> I'm like the good witch in the Wizard of Oz. You've always had the power, Mr. President. You're the commander in chief. Your number one job is defend the borders. So what happens now? I mean, you, no one's budging an inch here. Democrats don't seem to want to budge an inch, and the president doesn't either. I mean, we can't have the government shut down forever. It's very silly for Democrats to hold up funding the government while they're weeping about the federal employees, which with much better benefits, retirement plans, and vacation and sick leave than anyone watching this program has. Um, if they're going to keep weeping about these federal employees, OK, you're holding it up for 0.11% of the federal budget. I mean, at some point, I think people are gonna realize that this is just the Democrats. Uh, they're obsessing on this wall because they want Trump to break a promise. Is there a point where it starts to concern you? No. That the government is shut down for two months? I mean, possibly, I'm not going, I don't know, but just play this out, keep it focused on immigration. As long as people are talking about immigration, you are winning, Mr. President. But whatever happens, just build the wall Okay, how does it end? Why is he not doing this the way you want him to do it? How should he do it? How should well, he get that wall? Yeah, okay, he screwed up for two years and didn't. But mm. <laughs> finally, with, with three seconds on the clock, he's finally throwing the ball. So I can't, I mean, look, I'm not gonna complain about that. As long as he makes the fight about immigration, he will win. I noticed the polls right after his Oval Office address. Mm, for one thing, wow, we didn't hear much about polls after that Oval Office address. And finally, one gets produced, and yeah, most people agreed with him. You have to give something up, don't you? I mean, it's just the nature of the negotiation. He's the already Democrats given, are not going to fold look, like a house of cards. I'm, what do you give up? 
Trump has already given up, 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 up. I mean, I, I'm sorry that it turns out he's the worst negotiator God ever created, but that's where we are. He needs 20 billion for a wall. He's already only asked for 5.7 billion. Just spend it and we get, get the government up and running again. I thought he was a great negotiator. He was a great businessman. Um, turns out that was exaggerated. <laughs> You got to do something. I mean, Democrats are not going to just say, all right, here's the wall. Let's get the TSA guys we'll back to work. see what happens. Oh, gosh, they'll have to wait a few months before they know fully well they're going to be paid in full. Look, I'm not in favor of this, but this previous shutdowns have been much more difficult. More Americans dying of drug overdoses every year than died in the entire course of the Vietnam War. And the vast majority of those drugs are being brought in um, because we have a wide open border. I care about that more than I care about the Yosemite gift shop being open. There's two Ann Coulters here. There's the Ann Coulter that wrote in Trump We Trust and supported him during the campaign and introduced him. And then there's the other one that acknowledges that all this stuff has been usurped by Wall Street, by people in the administration. They yes. didn't drain the swamp. That's He's fair to say. He's wading through the swamp, right? <laughs> so great, fantastic. Donald Trump talks a good game for, for people who agree with you. But what the hell does he do? For 18 months, he said all the right things. He never cared about what Manhattan elite said. And then, bam, election day 2016, suddenly all he wants is the approval of Manhattan elites. <laughs> Who could have seen that coming? But recently, in the last couple of weeks, we've reeled him back. I mean, the one thing I think, not only with Trump, I think especially with Trump, but with anyone, is self-preservation and self-esteem. So why is he digging his heels in on immigration that's now? Why, that's why. But why now? It is self-preservation because he is dead in the water if he doesn't build that wall. Dead, dead, dead. On Capitol Hill today, senators got their first crack at publicly questioning William Barr. Raise your right hand, please. President Trump's pick to replace Jeff Sessions as attorney general. I do. With Republicans controlling the Senate, Barr is expected to be confirmed. It would be his second go around as the country's top cop after serving under President George H.W. Bush. Before being tapped by Trump, Barr released a memo publicly criticizing parts of the Mueller investigation. Today, he pledged to let Mueller finish his job, but didn't promise to release the special counsel's report. Instead, he said he may only be allowed to publish a summary. I, I don't know what, what uh, at the end of the day, what will be releasable. I don't know what Bob Mueller is, is writing. Democratic senators, including at least three expected to run in 2020, used the forum to question Barr over other hot-button issues, including press freedom, sentencing reform, border security, and immigration. President George H.W. Bush um, said back in 1980 that immigration is not just a link to America's past, but it's a bridge to America's future. We have a great system, potential. I, I think it needs reforming, but legal immigration has been good for the United States. There's actually a lot to explore when it comes to Barr's views on immigration. That's because Barr has a reputation as an immigration hardliner. And as head of the DOJ, he will have ultimate authority over things like asylum and refugee status. Barr's predecessor, Jeff Sessions, used that authority to push through unilateral and dramatic changes, making it significantly harder for migrants to gain asylum and making it easier to deport them. Asylum was never meant to alleviate all problems, even all serious problems, that people face every day all over the world. Sessions was able to do all this because immigration judges and the court called the Board of Immigration Appeals are not part of the judicial branch. They work for the attorney general. He has the power to refer cases to himself and overrule any immigration decision he disagrees with. The Department of Justice and the Attorney General are charged by the Immigration and Nationality Act as being responsible for interpreting U.S. immigration law. And it was done by Congress that the Attorney General be, at least in the first instance, the decider of what a specific immigration law meant that was ambiguous. Typically, attorneys general have used this authority sparingly. But as with so much else, including trade and the travel ban, 
the Trump administration has been much more willing than previous administrations to take advantage of loopholes to rewrite law. The attorney general is trying to take areas where Congress has given the attorney general discretion and to say, how can we use that discretion to make the immigration court system as restrictive as possible? Last month, a judge overturned the domestic violence ruling, but the government is likely to appeal. And all indications are that Barr will maintain a hard line on immigration. As attorney general in the early 1990s, Barr made it harder for refugees fleeing Haiti to seek asylum and endorsed the idea of summary deportation hearings. Congress could take away the attorney general's power over these matters, but it won't which doesn't bode well for the hundreds of thousands of migrants whose fate he'll soon control. But stiff back or stiff knee, you stand straight at tip knee. I've been very fortunate in my life. I've never played a character I wasn't in love with, madly in love with. I didn't know she wanted to be a donor. And I'm so glad, I'm so proud of her. You know, people said oh, years ago that you don't want to sign up to be a donor because they won't save your life. But the hospital fought so hard to save her life. It just wasn't meant to be. <laughs> Kristen loved making people happy. She loved making people laugh. She loved to party. She had rowdy friends. <laughs> and she was a rowdy girl. <laughs> but I loved her so much. I could put up with the rowdiness right now. <laughs> this is her daddy and Kristen, and they, we were at a wedding. They danced and partied, and, and her boyfriend was there, and oh my, when I get her ashes, I will, I'm gonna have her buried with her daddy. And I'm proud that she can be the donor, but I'd, I'd rather have my daughter. <laughs> The opioid epidemic in Kentucky and in our region, I think really started uh, to affect us about three to four years ago. But we saw some ERs, five, 600% increase in uh, overdoses within a matter of a year. The silver lining to this devastating situation is this surge in overdoses has um, provided a surge in organ donors. You have to determine while they were down, what was the level of brain damage. If there's no blood flow to the brain, the brain is dead by definition. Uh, I tell families the person that you knew and loved is gone. And now what we have is the shell of their body uh, that's still here. I know the heart's still beating, but the brain is not working and won't work again. Her finger was going like that a while ago. It was sort of shaking, just like mine. And uh, they said it was a for nerve in her spine or something like that, I don't know. But uh, before they did the test on her brain, it, she wasn't moving at all, nothing was moving. This is Ashley. All right, this is a 38-year-old woman. She overdosed uh, on meth and heroin. This patient came in um, a little over a day ago. Uh, she was with her significant other. And he found her actually in the bed and um, she wasn't breathing, so he called 911. The patient is a labeled high-risk organ donor. She is hep C positive, which we see a lot now due to the drug epidemic. Most of our patients are hep C positives and they make those recipients aware because at that point it's the recipient's choice if they're willing to take that risk. 
Her liver numbers did triple. They elevated, uh, but they're trending back down now. Are you interested or? And we did go into it saying this is gonna this is gonna be difficult to find a recipient because they're kind of in you know what we call marginal shape. They're not they're not great, but they're not bad enough to not offer them. A lot of the organs take a really big hit when you overdose and you're down and nobody finds you for four hours. Uh, that takes a hit on your body and you know they don't want to put the recipient at risk for not having it take. I, don't, I mean we've like doubled the bicarb drip, haven't we? Yeah. I mean let's just push an amp then. We'll just give her a little burst. Yeah, we'll just push in. So far I have um, allocated the liver that has, and uh, the heart I'm still working on and the kidneys I'm also still working on. I have interest in them. Um, I think hopefully we can find a recipient but right now I don't have one. You did such a good job, Chris. Goodness. <sighs> you get in situations where um, nobody will take the organ and it's heartbreaking. Sometimes I go through and I, I can't find a recipient and, it, and it's awful to have to know for that family that they're not gonna get that silver lining, if you will, or um, the kind of only happy thing that can come out of a loved one overdosing. Let me just break that down. Okay. They're gonna take her down the hall and they'll do a tribute to her. I said if she could, she'd set up and wave. I know she would. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Does everybody have five minutes? Yeah. A lot of what I do is talking with people um, on waiting lists in a room just like the one we're sitting in here. The conversation goes a lot like, Doc, am I going to be a drug addict if I accept this organ? Um, and we tell them 100% no. When we get the organs, we flush the donor's blood completely out. For the most part, you can use basically everything in the abdomen, such as your liver and kidneys, because those are more filtering organs. They typically try to get rid of stuff that's in our bloodstream. It's ultimately the patient's decision, right? We don't coerce anyone to take the organs. We don't change their place on the list or what have you, you know, but we just like for them to have all of the elements that they need to make an informed decision. And what I tell them is that, you know, there's a very small chance that they will contract something. But then we talk about as well their risk of dying on the wait list if they don't accept the organs. We know that their chances of dying on the wait list increase threefold. So if I'm putting myself in the position of my patient and a high risk organ becomes available for me, um, say a kidney, and I've been going to dialysis for however many years, three times a week for four hours a day, you better believe I'm taking that organ. Now we have medications that can, you know, cure the biggest thing that most people can get, which is hepatitis C. Most programs across the country are using these organs now without hesitancy. Five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say this uh, to patients, but because there is a cure, more people are willing to take the chance of um, taking these types of organs. Nine. But it told me this kitten was on its way, but it was coming from out of state. It was in the middle of 
Social Security Bureau. And you know, you're really not supposed to have your telephone on or anything. But I told the people, I said, I'm waiting on the kidney just like that. So I'm not cutting my phone off, being honest with you. When I answered the phone and they told me that this was the transplant kidney, I just started crying. Just, I was discombobulated all the way. I just started hollering, jumping, and praising God so much until they didn't even come near me because I told them, don't come near me right now. Don't come near me. I said, this is about my kidney. All I know is that she was found in her 30s. They said that when she was an IV user and she had died in a drug overdose. Oh, no, my knees, girl. When you think about, you know, not taking it, you think about, you know, going back to Dallas and being sick all the time, you should be grateful to receive that organ because, you know, your wrists are so low. So I told them, I said, as far as I'm concerned, it can have hep G, L, F, or whatever you want. I said, but well, get me one off just like that. And they just laughed. I said, I don't care what it got, just get me one. And that's what they did. Since then, everything has been going pretty smooth and calm. I'm not having any issues with my new kidney. Hey, Doc, how you doing? Good. What we do uh, to prevent transmission of hepatitis C from the donor to the recipient is use the same drugs uh, which are used to treat hepatitis C. We will give one dose of a medication right before transplant and then give uh, three doses after transplants. The alternative would be to give the full 12 weeks of treatments. Yeah. Uh, so with like our strategy, okay. uh, we were able to reduce the transmission uh, from 100% uh, to 13%. So the kidney function is uh, stable. The hepatitis C virus, which we've been checking for you, uh, has stayed negative. It's been negative since the day of your transplant. This time you gotta come to me. <laughs> <laughs> If I could speak to the family that um, was the donor of my kidney, I just first would give them a big hug. There are no words for to, to express how I feel, but I, in an attempt to try, I want you to know that I thank you so very much, and I'm grateful to be alive.